Well, good morning. We doing all right, church? Y'all have a good time in worship this morning? I told the worship team, and, and I hope you do too. I hope every, well, I hope you do it every day, but I hope especially on Sunday mornings that your worship starts before you walk in these doors. Um, if we want to really see the, the Spirit of God move and, and we want Him to come and inhabit the praises of His people, then we need to line our hearts before we ever walk in here. We need to give Him worship. We need to give Him praise because He's worthy. Amen? Today, before we dive in, we're going to keep moving in our Revelation series a little bit at a time. and um, We're going to be opening the first seal today. Well, we, well, we're not going to be opening it, but we're going to be looking at Jesus opening the seal yeah let's let's not go there amen come lord jesus come but we need to remember a few things before we before we dive in um and y'all to know the answer to this question by now who is actively breaking the seals jesus is the lion the tribe of judah the lamb that was slain, the son of man. Jesus is the one who is methodically, strategically, perfectly, he's breaking each and every seal. Just in his perfect time, just as it should be. And why is that important to us? Why do we need to be reminded and remember that? Here's why. Here's why. This time, when it gets here and we're going through this, if we're here during that time, listen, it's going to get very, we're going to feel like things are out of control. It's going to be a time where we feel like things are chaotic and scary and confusing. In a time where it seems like the, the captain has left the helm. That there's nobody steering the ship anymore. When the waves are the highest and the wind's blowing the hardest, we need to remember that not only is the captain still there guiding the ship, but he's the one actually releasing the storm, and he's the one in control of the waves. So we need to remember that the waves are coming, and they will get higher, but it's because Jesus has authorized it. Satan's not doing this. Jesus is breaking the seals. And the question is, do we, when things get tough, do we, do we jump? Do we jump ship and, and take our chances in the murky water, or do we trust the captain? When the ship is violently being tossed to and fro, and the ship is starting to come apart, here's the thing, desperate times calls for desperate measures, right? So in desperation, will we either jump ship, or will we trust the captain all the way through? See, here's what we got to understand, guys. There is no plan B. Do you realize that? This has been, this is a divine decree. There is no plan B, and praise God there's not, because God's plan is perfect. There's no plan B to calm water, sunny skies, and white beaches. Praise God, we will get there for a child of the king. But we cannot go around or avoid the storm. In this world, we will have trouble. We have to go through it. It has been divinely decreed. But church, on the other side is paradise. Do we realize, and I don't know how far you've read into the seals yet, but do you realize in the fourth seal, some of y'all can be like, I just don't like this kind of preaching. This is just a reality. Listen to me. The fourth seal, when it's opened, a quarter of the earth's population dies in one seal. Just wiped out. Right now, let me put it in perspective. We've got 8 billion people on the earth. And open that seal alone, that means approximately 2 billion people are going to die. Now, to put that into perspective, the United States population is about 335 million people. To get to 2 billion people, that would mean it would be like the correlation of, of every single person in the United States dying six times over in the tearing of one seal of the scroll. And the reason I say that is this. Man, we can't even imagine what that... Can you imagine the chaos that would cause? Can you imagine all the different thoughts that might be running through our heads and how desperate we will feel and hopeless it might feel for some people? Can you imagine the total confusion all across the world? Now listen, I want you to understand, I'm not saying this to be sensational or, or to get you all worked up about it. I'm really not because I know who's in control of the waves, 
But, but that's what God's Word says. That's what the Scripture says. And the study in Revelation, y'all, it's not just about gaining an intellectual understanding. It's about changing our lives. It's pastoral. It's practical. Revelation is written in a way to prepare us. That, that whatever's already been decreed to prepare us, that we will have hope no matter what it comes all the way through the storm. Revelation is very practical. Now, here's the thing. I don't want us to develop a picture of Jesus over there excitingly. I just can't wait to open this seal. Because that's not what Jesus is doing. Y'all been watching too much reality. Jesus is not one of those deranged people, you know, on cold case files that gets some kind of pleasure out of people's suffering. It's not that. If there was another way, if there was another way, a plan B to bring complete healing and restoration to the heavens and the earth. But here's the thing. In God's infinite wisdom... And his sovereignty, he knows this is the only way. And so I can see it kind of like this correlation. Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And in the same way, for the joy set before him, knowing where it's heading, for the joy set before us, being with him forever, he tears open the seals. By giving us these things in advance, praise God, he's given us all these things to know and to prepare our hearts and our lives. But you know what else I'm figuring out? It's not only just to prepare ourselves, church, but y'all, this is an incredible evangelistic tool to reach people when we begin to see these things unfold. What do I mean by that? Whoever, whatever generation sees this, whether it's our generation or our kids' generation or on down years before now, whatever generation, if we know the detailed prophecies in this book, do you know prophecy is to the T? It is very detailed. It's going to happen exactly like it says. And if we know these things, think about it. World's in chaos. Everybody's chaotic. They don't know where to go. They, everything feels dark. There seems to be no hopelessness. I mean, there seems to be no hope. But then we can point to the Scripture and say, but there is hope. There's hope because what was prophesied even two, 3,000 years ago is happening right now before us. And, and here's even what we can expect next. You're talking about an evangelistic tool. That's what the disciples did. That's what Jesus did. They pointed back to the prophets and said, look, this is what's happening right now. So before we open the seal, let's especially for some that may not have been here last week, let's remind ourselves of the foundational kind of framework that we put these seals in. Because, again, John would have already, he'd have had a lens to filter all this through. He would have known the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets real well. He would have known Jesus' words well, and everything would have been filtered through that. And to not have some kind of framework in these seals, it would make the seals extremely ambiguous. In other words, we could say, well, that's that. Well, I think it was this. Well, I think it was Chernobyl. Have y'all heard that one, one of the seals? Well, that was back when Chernobyl happened. We could just try to point, we've got to have a framework. And, and if we don't have a framework, I think is about the best we can do. So we have to have the same lens, the same framework that John had. And what we looked at is Daniel's uh, 70th week. We looked at that, and we, we kind of come up with a graph based off of that, the last seven years that God has decreed. And we also compared the six seals with Jesus' words in Matthew 24, and we came up kind of with this framework. So let's, let's look at it together. Kind of this example of a chart. There's some things we know for sure. Daniel's 70th week says it starts with the covenant with the Antichrist. It is as clear as day there in Daniel chapter 9. We also know what is clear as day is that at the midpoint of that final seven years is when, when the Antichrist comes in, he sets himself up in the temple, and that he causes what they call, sets up the abomination that causes desolation. That's at the midpoint. And... We know that based off of Jesus' words in Matthew 24 and looking at the seals, it seems like, it seems like that what Jesus calls birth pains is the first few seals, 
And then what he calls the great tribulation would be seal five and seal six. Five, you know, being the martyrs that were slain under the altar. Seal six being the cosmic disturbances that take pl place. And then we arrive at the day of the Lord where he comes on the clouds and he, it says that he gathers that the dead in Christ rise first and then he gathers those who are alive to him during that time. That's what's described as the day of the Lord. So we can move on from that. If we don't start with some kind of framework, we will be all over the place with these seals. Yes, have we seen war in our history? Famines, pestilences, have we seen all those things? Yeah, all throughout history. But these seals in Revelation, they're specific. They're not just what has been played out in history, but these are specific seals being opened up in succession, in succession of one another and it goes on the framework, it's in the framework of Daniel's 70th week. And to put it outside of that would be so inconsistent, so ambiguous, and it would just basically be, well, whoever has the best guess wins. And church, if the Bible says, if the Word of God says that we could experience this monumental moment, or that our family could experience, or that you could experience it, or our grandchildren could experience it, listen, I need something better than just the best guess wins. I don't want to play Russian roulette with prophecy. Amen? So we have a framework. Let's turn to the first seal. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. Revelation 6, verse 1. Just a couple verses here. Now I watched, John said, when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures. It's amazing that Jesus is using the living creatures to do this. With a voice like thunder, come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. And its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. So here's what John sees. He sees a rider on a white horse. And he's carrying a bow. That's what he sees. This rider, he's got a bow in his hand. And then John specifically says that a crown was given to him. In other words, he didn't ride out with the crown. The crown was actually given to him. That's important. We'll get to that in a second. This rider, he says, came out conquering. So as soon as he rode out, he was already conquering to some degree. But then it splits it up and says, and to conquer. So there's this idea of he's conquering when he comes out, and then he's on a conquest, kind of a future conquest as well. Now, let me make a couple quick comments, and some of y'all going to think, what in the world people actually believe that? And some of you in here might believe it. I don't know. I, but I want to say it just in case. No, the coronavirus, coronavirus was not the opening of the first seal, Okay. That's something that's been out there. Well, corona means crown, and, and it's opening. See, that's that ambiguous thing that I'm talking about. That's, that's one of those things that it has no biblical basis. It's just speculation and sensationalism. Another idea, and this one has a little bit, bit more merit. Another idea that's been out for a while is that the rider on the white horse is Jesus himself. Okay, that's, that's a fairly common idea. And that one, that one I can see, I can understand at the surface level. Um, and here's why. Revelation 19, starting in verse 11, talks about Jesus riding in on, guess what? What color horse? A white horse, and what does he have on his head? A crown, but it, it, says, uh, it says many crowns, diadems on his head. And he comes out to judge and make war against his enemies at this point. So he's definitely riding out to conquer. So can you see how you kind of get that idea? Well, let me give you a few reasons, just a few reasons why this can't be Jesus. Okay? Number one, the timing's off. The, 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 that's why a framework matters. It's because the timing's off here. One's at the beginning of the seven years where the seal's being opened. Jesus is, is riding in on a white horse at the end, right before the millennium reign he comes in. So the first reason is just the timing's off. The second reason is the crown. The crown that was placed on the rider in the first seal is a different kind of crown than what Jesus wears when he returns. The rider in the first seal is wearing, wearing a crown that someone would have won in like a sporting event. 
It's not like what you would think a gold crown. It's more like a wreath or a garland that they'd place on their head. Um, it's not a, in other words, it's not a kingly crown like Jesus would wear. And Jesus in Revelation, he's wearing a diadema, which is a king's crown. In fact, he wears many of them because he's the king above all kings. So there's a difference there. The third reason why it's not Jesus, and this one is significant. The writer didn't have a crown riding out. A crown was given to him. Church Jesus doesn't need a crown given to him. He has a crown because of who he is. And the next reason, it's just, it's just logical. Y'all, the other three horses, are they good things? Ne are they positive or negative things? negative things right so what would it wouldn't make sense logically that the first well there's jesus and then all these no that they would be it would be a negative thing as as well so there's many reasons this can't be jesus so who or what is the white horse rider that's carrying a bow that's given a crown who is described as coming out he's already conquering but he's bent on continuing to conquer now y'all know my answer because we talked about it last week just briefly this first this fits the description of the final antichrist the man of lawlessness, the man of perdition, the man of destruction. He's got many different names. And here's what we're going to attempt to do in the next few minutes. We're going to try to stay just in these few, few verses. Like, what are the implications of what we just read? And, and it'll build, that this theology of the Antichrist, it'll build as we go. Because do you know, like he is a central figure within this seven-year period. And so our understanding of him will grow. But we're going to try today to focus just on this first seal and then that, that area. I want to give you a summary sentence. So when you think of someone who's a rider on a white horse who's carrying a bow, who's given a crown, who goes out conquering and to conquer. Here's my summary sentence to kind of lead us off. What it's describing is some kind of leader who is victorious and prospers in what he sets out to do. He's conquering. He's been given a crown. But here's the thing. It's not in his own power church. A crown was given to him let me show you some of those passages revelation chapter 13 verse 7 it's not by his own power it says also it and it's referring to the first beast which is the antichrist here in that passage was allowed everybody say he was allowed yeah he didn't do it himself he was allowed to go make war on the saints and to what to conquer them and authority was actually what given to him over every tribe and people and language and nation. Look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. It says, He shall speak words against the Most High, and he shall wear out the saints. So again, he's conquering them. He's wearing them out of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be what? We see that word again. They're given into his hands. He didn't take it. They've been given into his hands for a time, times and a half, time, three and a half years, great tribulation. Okay, the last part of Daniel 8, it also pertains to the Antichrist. So look at how this vision is interpreted. Daniel chapter 8 verse 24 says this about his power shall be great, but what does it say? Not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction and sa shall succeed. So he's going to prosper in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall become great. Without warning he shall destroy many again conquering, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes. And then look what happens to him after that. And he shall be broken, but by, not by human hands. He's going to come back and deal with him himself. And so it's clear, this is what we have here. It is clear that the Antichrist will be given a crown for a certain amount of time. And he'll be victorious. He'll, he'll prosper in what he does for a certain amount of time. He'll be given a limited authority, limited power, but he will actually be empowered by Satan himself. Go to Revelation 13, the dragon, Satan himself. But listen to me, church. Only according to God's sovereign 
permissible will. Who's opening the seals? Who's in control of it? Jesus. Who's in the control of what the Antichrist can and can't do? Jesus. Listen to me, church. Satan has not pulled a fast one on God here. And nowhere in your life has Satan ever pulled a fast one on God. It has already been written that his final destruction will come and it's already been decreed. Creed. He only has the power and the authority that God has allowed Satan to give him in order to accomplish his good, his good and perfect will. Now, did you notice how the scripture emphasizes that he came out conquering and to what? And to conquer. So again, this idea of he's conquering, but there's a future. Now, what we just read, because we won't talk anymore about this part this week. Because I think what we just read, those passages, it's talking about the to conquer part. And the reason I say that is because this is pointing more to the time he's revealed at the midpoint. After he breaks the covenant, he goes out, he makes war against Israel, the followers of Jesus. And this is what we call the great tribulation, Jacob's trouble. He is pictured here at this time. Here's how he's conquering. Through war, force, might, power, strength. After the midpoint. But what I noticed was this. When he first comes out riding, he's conquering. But he's conquering in a different way. And I want to show you that in Daniel chapter 11. Now, I have to kind of give this caveat. Daniel chapter 11 at this point, this kind of going through some historical things. Or for us, it was history. That we can pinpoint this happened. I mean, detailed stuff. When you get to this point is what would be called, I think this is kind of a dual role fulfillment. Okay? Um, th this might be talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. But what it's pointing to is the greater Antichrist. What it's pointing to, I believe, is ultimately it's pointing to this final Antichrist. So look at Daniel chapter 11, verse 21. This is when he's writing out. Okay? It says, In his place shall arise... So he's writing out a contemptible, so vile, despicable person to whom royal majesty has not been given. In other words, this guy, listen, he don't have a crown. He doesn't come from a royal line. He shall come in without warning. And another word there, instead of coming out without, without warning, um, some translation says he comes peaceably and obtains or seizes the kingdom by, by say it, by what? How does he come? Does he come through war there? It's through actual flatteries. Now, if you did a word study on that word flatteries, it can be translated this, smooth promises. So this vile person, he rises up without a royal line. They call him in Scripture the little horn. So he's just kind of, this kind of rises up out of nowhere, no royal line, and he comes in peaceably and he seizes the kingdom by smooth promises. And then let's go on into verse 22. It says, Army shall be utterly swept away before him and broken. So at some point he has a strong military army behind him, even the prince of the covenant. Verse 23, And from the time that an alliance is made with him, he shall act how? Deceitfully, and he shall become strong. So later he will become strong with a small People. And I want to make sure that we see this in verse 23. It says, from the time that the alliance is made, he shall act deceitfully. So he's this vile person. From, from the very beginning, he's vile, he's contemptible, but he keeps this vileness hidden under wraps, and he comes in and he seizes the kingdom through smooth promises. So here's what he basically is. He's a manipulator. And he's smooth at it. He comes in as a manipulator, a negotiator that can work, work both sides and disguise himself successfully until his true colors are revealed for those who are watching. Now, I want you to think back. Our framework. Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks tells us the final week, the 70th week, starts how? How does it start? Y'all are not talking to me. The what? Covenant, right? 
He makes a covenant. It, Daniel 9, 27 says that this man, this little pea prince, shall come and make a strong covenant with many for one week. Now think about covenant with me a minute. What is covenant essentially? At the very foundation, what is a covenant? You are making a what? You're making a promise. You're making promises. A list of promises forms a covenant. We Think about it. We make a covenant with our husband or our wife when we get married, right? You know it's a covenant. We promise to have and to hold from this day forward, better or worse, rich or poor, sickness, health, till death do us part, we make this covenant. Covenant is essentially an unbreakable promise. Now think about it. Think about how the Antichrist comes in conquering. How does he ride in? He conquers by how? Flatteries. Promises. He's really good at making smooth promises, brokering deals, but he does it very, very deceitful. In other words, he's hiding his true intention. He successfully hides his true self and intentions. Think about going into a marriage, and you've been married for, for years, just to find out years down the road that there's been a secret that your spouse has been hiding forever. They make promises that they, they did, didn't match their true intentions. The, the promises won't stand in the end because it was built on a foundation of deceit on lies. A couple months ago, and if you weren't here, this might go a little bit over your head. I'll do my best to explain it without doing the message again. A couple months ago, we talked about some current events that transpired um, has been transpiring in the, the Middle East. Y'all remember when we talked about that after October 7th and we kind of looked at some things that were happening and we looked at Ezekiel 38, that prophecy, the prophecy of Gog, Gog of Magog. And, and it talks about this coalition of nations that gather up with Gog. It gives the location who these nations are that are going to come and invade Israel. And do you remember I showed you a map on the screen where all these historical places exist today? Do y'all remember that? We had this current modern map. And do you remember, anybody remember, try to speak to me, the majority of where these names in Ezekiel 38, where they exist today? Do you remember? Yeah, most of them were right there in modern-day Turkey. Some may be Syria, Iraq, um, Iran, which is Persia. And then you had like a couple North African nations, Libya and, and Sudan. And, and, and listen, I know this may come to a surprise to some of us, but, but just under, none of these nations that are mentioned in that text are European or Russian. Now, that doesn't mean they won't be involved. I think the whole world will be involved. But that's, they're not mentioned there. All of these nations are Israel's neighbors. They literally surround Israel, which means what? Do you remember the little red speck in the middle of all the green? All those nations are what kind of nations? The Muslim, Islamic nations. In fact, the majority of names mentioned in Ezekiel 38, you got Magog and Meshach and Tubal and Gomer and Beth Gomer, they're all located in the heart of the old Islamic Ottoman Empire. So just north of Israel, what would be called Asia Minor. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, I believe is one of, if not the greatest detailed prophecy, speaking about the region that, the, that Gog will rise out of, that he'll come out of, or a.k.a. the Antichrist, where he'll come from. From everything that I can gather in Ezekiel from Daniel's interpretation of the statue dream, the Antichrist will most likely come from the area of the old Islamic Ottoman Empire. Not a Roman, a revived Roman Empire, but the old Islamic Ottoman Empire. That are the, that's the nations that are listed. Now again, I know that may be a shock to some of you, and I don't have time to kind of rehash that. But here's why I mention it. Kevin, why do you say all that? One of the main objections to the Antichrist possibly being Islamic and coming from the region is this is what people will say. They'll say, well, Israel would never receive a Muslim as their Jewish Messiah. Well, first of all, that's a wrong statement. This is a common misconception about the Antichrist. Do you know, nowhere in Scripture does it say that the Jewish people will receive the Antichrist as their Jewish Messiah. It doesn't say that anywhere in Scripture. 
I don't know where that idea came from, but it's, it's not in Scripture. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that this man, the Antichrist, will even claim to be the Jewish Messiah. In fact, do you know he sets himself up to be supreme, superior to the Jewish God? In fact, he begins to speak slanderous things about the Most High God and the Messiah, not claim to be him. I mean, how much sense would that make? He's going to start slandering the, the, the Jewish God and then say, and by the way, I'm him. That, that, that doesn't even make sense. And again, I'm not sure where that picture came from, but Scripture just simply doesn't say it. Some will say this. Here's another uh, objection. But Israel would never trust a Muslim. Israel would never trust a Muslim nation, especially after October 7th, uh, after what Hamas did, and now what Hezbollah is doing. They would never enter into a trust agreement with a Muslim nation. And here's my response to that. Of course they would. Of course they would. They've been doing it for years. Have you, have you heard of the Abraham Accords? Guess who that's with? It is security alliances, normalization with Israel's neighbors, which are all what? Islamic nations. And, and, and it's in the, here's what you have to understand. It's in the interest of Israel to make those alliances with them. So I want you to stew on something for me, okay? In Ezekiel 38, it talks about the Antichrist and his army, which are Islamic majority nations, attacking a land of unwalled villages. Y'all remember us talking about that? I want to read that little section again together. Ezekiel 38, verse 10. It says, Thus says the Lord God, On that day, so there's a certain day, thoughts will come into your mind, talking about Gog, and you will devise an, uh, an evil scheme and say, I will go up, go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls, having no bars or gates, to seize spoil and carry off plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited, and the people who were gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell at the center of the earth. And when the Bible says the center of the earth, he's talking about Jerusalem. Here's what I want you to stew on. Is Israel there now? Peace, safety, security, no walls, security gates, any of that? Are they there now? Absolutely not. Like what they're going through, they're, they're not dwelling in safety and security right now. They're attacked from the south from Hamas, the threat from the north of Hezbollah, being attacked at the West Bank. All these attacks, listen, by Islamic extremist groups. So church, listen to me. If that's going on, that storm's going on, who better to come in and establish an agreement that can lead to a period of false peace and security than what seems to be a more moderate Muslim? Who better to step on the scene and broker an agreement with Muslims than a Muslim? Who better to come in with other nations and lay out the conditions of agreement that both sides can sign off on and agree on? You, well, you'll get this, and if you do this, you'll get this. This will benefit all parties. Do you know Israel? I get so tired of hearing people say Israel is the aggressors. That they're the aggressors. Listen, Israel wants nothing more than to just live peaceably in the land that God has promised them. Now, I'm not saying Israel's perfect. We know that, amen. Nobody's perfect. But their supreme desire is we want to be a nation where we are secure and we have the land that God has promised us. So I can tell you, if a man comes in, that has a plan that can appease both sides and has the might and the power behind him to implement and sustain that plan with other nations signing on and bolstering that plan, you better believe Israel's going to say, show me where to sign, and they're going to sign the dotted line. And this is kind of an excursion, but it goes together. What do you think it will take for a new temple or tabernacle to be built? If he's going to desecrate it, the Antichrist, it has to be rebuilt, right? And it's not talking about the church or a spiritual temple. He's talking about a real temple, okay? What's it going to take? 
It's going to take a mediator figure. It's going to take a Muslim who seems at first a more moderate, who can relate to to the side of resistance and benefit both sides. Now, here's the thing. I believe a temple, a temple could, it could come before the covenant's ever signed. We don't really know. Scripture doesn't tell us when it will actually happen or be rebuilt. So I think it could happen, but I also think the Antichrist, it's likely that it could come as, as a piece of that comprehensive agreement. It could be part of those promises, those false pro- promises that sweeten the pot. But here's what really hit me this week. This covenant, if you think about it, with the Antichrist, it is essentially reaffirming that Israel has the right to the land. In some degree, it's going to be, it's going to be reaffirming that Israel has the right to the land, that they have a right to be a nation, that they have a right to live in peace and security. Is that not, is that not what God essentially promised in all the covenants in the Old Testament? It is, right? Let's look at them briefly. Genesis 12, verse 1. The covenant with God and with Abram. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. In other words, I will take care of you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It's confirmed over and over again. Genesis 15, 18. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring, I give this land, and he even defines it, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And by the way, that's bigger than what Israel is today. Genesis 17, verse 7. We see the same thing. And I will establish my covenant, God says, between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for a what? An everlasting covenant. This is a covenant that will last forever. To be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Do you see, essentially, the Antichrist, he's doing it deceitfully. But what he's doing, he's reaffirming the covenant with Israel. But here's the problem. He's trying to step in as mediator of it. This vile person led by Satan is deceitfully entering into promises with God's people, promises of the land, promises of security and safety. Remember what Israel wants above everything else? Safety, security, the land that God has promised. And now the Antichrist is trying to step in and be the mediator of the covenant. And here's the problem with that. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator. He's the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Here's what we got to know about Israel. And most of you know this. Orthodox Jews, do they believe in Jesus or not? Yeah, most Orthodox Jews, they don't believe in Jesus, that he's the Messiah. But I will tell you what they do believe. They still believe in the promises of God. So when they're beaten down and they're bruised by all of its neighbors, here's the thing, they will do everything they can to live in that peace, in that security, and that safety. But the problem is, here's what's happened, and this has happened for them generation through generation, and this is what will ultimately happen. The problem is they place their trust in this covenant with the Antichrist rather than God himself. And church, God is really serious about covenants. Did you know that? Look at Exodus chapter 23 verse 30. He doesn't like his people making covenants with other people. Little by little I will drive them out from before you, God says. So as you're going to take the land, I'm going to drive them out for you. Until you have increased and possessed the land. And I will set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines. And from the wilderness to the Euphrates. For I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand. And you shall drive them out before you. Now look at verse 32. 
you shall make. He's already made a covenant with them. You can have the land. I'll take care of it. I'll provide for you. You shall not make, make no covenant with them and their gods, the neighbor, neighbors. They shall not dwell in your land lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a what? A snare. It'll be a trap. If you make covenants with your neighbors, it will be a snare for you, a trap. Look at Exodus 34, 12. Same thing. Take care lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a what? A snare, a trap in your midst. Here's what God's telling them here. Israel, trust me. I'm your God. And I have made a covenant with you. I've made you an everlasting promise to be your God and you will be my people. I have made a promise to you to give you the land as your inheritance. I have made a promise to drive out all the enemies and to protect you. I have made a promise that you will dwell in peace and security. And so God is saying to his people, just trust me. Walk in my ways and the covenant I follow in my steps. Trust me for your safety and your peace. Trust in the only mediator of the covenant, Jesus Christ. Now think about it. When the nation of Israel enters into this covenant with the Antichrist, here's what they're essentially doing. They're placing their trust of safety and security and peace into a covenant that ultimately will be broken. And when the Antichrist and his army breaks the covenant at the middle of the seven, that's when it says it will happen, and he begins to wage war, they will realize at that point, they'll realize God's covenant is the only one that stands. It's the only one that we can place our trust in fully. And when Jesus returned, that's why the scripture says, this is why all of Israel will look upon the one that they have pierced and they will be saved but they'll be saved, church, through complete brokenness. They're saved through shattering. They will fully realize that their only trust can be placed in the Lord God Almighty. They will see that all of these covenants they've made with death, they've been once and for all, they've been annulled. I want to bring you back in closing to one, one point. Remember the boat in the storm? I was talking about the captain steering. When the storm intensifies in our lives, the waves get higher, the wind starts to blow, and we're pressed. We're pressed in a corner. And you get to a place where you come to a decision point. What or who do I really trust? Do I trust the captain of the ship? Or is the ship tearing apart and I think my chances is better outside of the ship and you abandon the ship? Listen, church, we need to realize the, the, the breaking the breaking is ultimately good because it reveals, it peels back the layers and it reveals where our trust really is. And it gives us the opportunity to course correct. If our trust is not where it needs to be, it gives us the opportunity to course correct. I wrote something down in my notes this week. Didn't know how I was going to use it, where it was going to go. So I'm just going to put it here in the closing, and I'm going to tell you basically how I wrote it down. Have you ever asked God why? Come on. You're going through situations, seeing things, the way it's playing out in the world, all these stuff. Have you ever asked God why? Of course you have. I have too. And I started thinking about that question. I said, God, why did you decree 70 cycles of sevens? Why that number? 490 years to bring everything to completion. Why didn't he just decree, you know, let's use a round number. Why didn't he use 100, you know, 100 cycles of seven, 700 years or something like that? Why did he only leave one cycle of seven to complete it all and not two cycles of sevens? Did God just randomly go and just pick it out of the air, you know, out of thin air? Church, what I come to the realization is this. He decreed it that way. He did it that way because of his great mercy, his great love, and his kindness. What do you mean by that? Well, think about it. He knew in his sovereignty and in his wisdom, he knew anything shorter than that time period would, would have not given enough time for certain individuals to turn to him and repent. 
And he knew that anything longer past that time wouldn't, wouldn't have been justice, that it would have been merciless to those who were crying out and going through those things. That number is decreed because in his infinite wisdom and his sovereignty and his love and his mercy and his kindness to people, he knew that this is what it would take. This was the exact number that it would take for the maximum number of people to come in and to trust in him. Church, our God is good. He is not slow in keeping his promises as, as we understand slowness, but he's patient with us, wishing that none shall perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I want you to stand together. I want you to ask yourself a very serious question. Where is my trust? And you're going to have to, I'm not, of course, Jesus, think about it. And when when I say that, church, I told the youth this the other night, or something similar to this. Think about if there was something in your life that if somehow you could lose, What would affect your life the most? Because if that's something inanimate, object, even relationships, I mean, those things are hard, absolutely. But it gives us a picture of what we trust in. What is it that brings you the most safety and the most security and the most peace that if that thing was taken away from you, you'd just melt? You'd just be done, be hopeless. Guys, I want to tell you, you can, do you know people are broken? People are going to hurt you and step on you over and over again. They're going to sometimes just lie straight to your face, and sometimes they don't even mean to. It just We're just people. We're broken. And sometimes we trust in relationships to bring us happiness and fulfillment and all these different things. But guys, if that's what we rely on and what we really trust... That's not going to last. And money and all these things that that we, we trust in in our life to bring us peace and security and safety and all these things, the reality is, guys, what would we do if everything right now just kind of stopped? If it just stopped and we didn't have all the things we have, would we still have hope? That's the question I'm asking. If everything was stripped away, Would we still have hope? And the answer is, if we trust in Jesus, absolutely. We can still have peace, and we can have joy through every every circumstance that we walk through. So let's pray together. Ask the Lord, search my heart. If there's anything that's keeping me from trusting you fully and completely, any area in my life that's not fully surrendered to you, God, I want you to show me so that I can surrender that to you today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to come together, to worship together with each other. God, you are the King. You're the King of kings. You're the Lord of lords. You're the Almighty God. Jesus, you alone are worthy. Every seal we walk through, God, you are in control, Jesus, of opening every single seal. And God, that brings me hope to know that not only are you driving the ship, not only are you in control of it all, but you're, you're bringing about the justice. Even the bad things that are happening, God, that, that the Antichrist can only have the power that you have allowed in your sovereign, permissible will. And God, that brings me hope. And it brings me hope because I know that the Father in heaven loves me. And I know that the Father in heaven loves us. And I know the Father in heaven knows what's best for us. And I know the Father in heaven has made promises to us that he is faithful to keep in every single way. And so then if 
whatever I go through, yeah, it's going to be hard. Things in our life that we go through in this world, you'll have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That's our hope. That's our peace. And so, God, today I pray, just reveal to us, me too, Lord. You Start with me. Start with me. If there's anything in me, God, any area of my life that I have not fully surrendered and trusted, entrusted to you, to guide my every step and to lead me where you want me to go. Now, God, I pray, help me, Lord, to just surrender that over to you fully and completely. Because, God, you can do a lot more with my life than I could ever do. You can take my life and give me joy. You can take my life and give me peace through every circumstance, no matter what I face. And so, God, today I pray if there's one individual in this place that is struggling and life might seem hopeless right now, there's this battle, this spiritual battle, or whatever it may be, I pray, God, speak to them, show them your love. Show them your plan, God, for their life. And show them, God, how much you love them and you care for them, God. And that they would surrender it all over to you and entrust their life to you today. God, we thank you for our time together. Go with us. Guide us, direct us, teach us all things. Lead us in truth. Guard our hearts, guard our minds. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Everybody say it. Amen. Amen.